Anybody who has questions later on, remember to talk directly into the top of the microphone and hold it close to your mouth. Thank you. Okay. Sure. <laughs> okay. All right, everybody, thanks for showing up. Uh, my name is Radman. Um, or my actual name is Christian, where you may know me better as Radman. Uh, about, uh, let's see, in 1990, I started a group called ACID, which, uh, which is an anti art group. Uh, they're now defunct as of 2004. Um, so we operated for almost a decade and a half, creating artwork from characters. So what I'm going to be showing today is different forms of art um, built from letters, numbers, characters that you'd find on a typewriter and such. I'm going to start off with some really early examples of this. Maybe. <laughs> All right, let's see. All right. Um, Prior to computer-based ASCII art, uh, we have examples of, of art created in a, you know, created from um, shaped text dating as far back as 304 BC. What you're looking at right here is a Roman Latin um, poem by Marcus Tullius uh, Cicero or Cicero. And um, <clears throat> this is over, this is, you know, this is over 2,000 years old. We also have uh, <coughs> shaped poems that started to show up um, in the 1600s. This is a poem called The Altar. It's a, a religious poem here. We also started to see concrete poetry show up in um, publishing such as Alice in Wonderland. Um, this is an 1865 novel. And at the end of the chapter, we have this, this tale here. And the sentence begins, it is a long tale, certainly. And to kind of convey that, he forms the, the rest of the text in a tale, in the shape of a tale. OK. This is an early, this is one of the most earliest uh, typewriters here. This is the first QWERTY key, um, keyboard typewriter. And it's fashioned after a sewing machine. So you can see it's very decorative. Um, at the time that this came out, um, it wasn't fashionable to have uh, what, what later became the typewriter in your home. So they made it kind of look like this, this work of art here. So it's very decorative. Uh, typewriters also created uh, opportunities for women in the workplace. I don't know how that got in there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it also um, created these kind of, uh, there's a lot of, the way that they marketed um, the typewriters, they were marketing them to the businessmen. Uh, <laughs> so I'm sure there's a lot of uh, sexual harassment lawsuits later down the road. Um, what you're looking at here is a uh, Corona folding typewriter. This is uh, kind of the precursor to a laptop. This literally folds in half inside of this uh, briefcase here. What we're going to go into now is um, type, typewriter art. Um, the very first example that we have of typewriter art dates back to 1898. It's the first preserved example. This was entered into a uh, typewriter speed typing contest. And so they started to have these um, in a way to promote typewriters and how fast they could type without jamming. Um, typewriter manufacturers had speed typing contests to say that our brand's the best. And then they also started to have typewriter art contests on the side. And these kind of became somewhat popular as well. And so this is the pr uh, first preserved example of that. Um, you can't see it really well, but 
Actually, I should just use this. But they use you know, X's and O's here for the framework, and here they're using the lines. And one thing that you can do with a typewriter that you can't do on a terminal or a computer is you can shift the orientation of the paper. So you can, um, you can take more advantage um, of what the typewriter can do. This is another example from uh, the mid-1900s um, by Dennis Collins. Uh, this particular person um, has, he's done typewriter portraits uh, for like the Queen of England. Here's a close-up of that. So you can see the, exactly uh, what he's using for the densities of the image uh, to achieve the shading. You can see that he's using an overstrike technique, which is also not uh, possible on a computer. So to get you know, really dark shading, he's able to you know, put a W on top of an M there and go back over it. Uh, this is one of my favorite examples of typewriter art. Uh, this was drawn by Paul Smith. Um, the reason why, there's a couple reasons why I really like this. Um, first of all, he uses a lot of typewriters uh, eventually started to have two colored ribbons uh, mul or multicolored ribbons. This has the black and the red ribbon. So he used that for, you know, the brick tiling of the house. Um, if you look really closely, you can see that, you know, the trees are made out of M's. But what I find, uh, he also uses a smudge technique, which is also something you can't achieve on a computer. Um, but what I really like about this, or what I really find most interesting about this, is that um, Paul Smith had cerebral palsy. And so he was unable to communicate. Um, his only means of communication was through a typewriter. So um, if he wanted to convey a message, he had to very painstakingly uh, steady one hand with the other and type one key at a time in order to get each key press. So um, his artwork was truly a labor of love because this was something that would take days and weeks uh, to complete. Um, but it was, the, you know, it, was his, it was his main means of communication. Um, he later decided that he wanted to orientate his room and have a, have a cabinet situated around his typewriter and redecorate things. So he actually drafted a blueprint with his typewriter of how he wanted this desk to look. And, uh, and then later it was built. Which is pretty amazing. Um, Paul Smith is still alive today. He's in a nursing home, and he's still continuing this typewriter art. Okay. Um, other places that text-based artwork started to show up uh, was, in, was with the teletype. And this is, this is kind of a precursor to the BBS, because now what we're seeing is, rather than somebody stationary um, designing uh, text-based artwork in their house, they're able to actually communicate with other people and send and transmit this artwork to somebody else. Uh, the very first evidence of teletype art uh, starts to show up in the um, early 1900s, 1920s. Um, the story is that's been passed on by uh, Ritty artists later on down the road is that um, typewriter, or excuse me, teletype art started to show up when people were bored. Uh, during the Christmas hours and they were, you know, monitoring the telegraph wires, they, were, they still had to work there. It's kind of like working at a network operations center, you know, over the weekend or something. You have nothing to do. So, you know, they would send messages, transmit messages to each other, and eventually they started to transmit uh, pictures, which became more and more elaborate over time. Uh, this is an example of radio teletype art. And uh, it's a perfect example. It's something that would uh, very easily translate into ASCII as well. There's no overstriking here at all. Okay, so as I mentioned before, uh, Ritty artists, they, they started to show up in the 1960s after they sort of received FCC approval to do this, um, to use the radio for other, other means. This is a very complex example of Ritty art um, sent over ham radio. Um, this was done by Don Royer uh, sometime in the 1970s. And this is actually four printed panels. So this would be sent from uh, one teletype machine to another at a rate of about 45 to 70 um, <laughs> baud. This is like 1,200 times slower than a standard uh, connection. And 
So, I mean, literally this would take, uh, you know, 30, 40 minutes per page. And if there was an error, there was no error correction, they'd have to start over and say, hey, this, this line was messed up or this was all messed up. So, I mean, this could take hours to receive from somebody else. But um, this is four printed out um, pages put together. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, most ham radio operators were men, and so they, you know, they like to, uh, <laughs> you know, they had an interest in this as well. Um, it was Miss December, 1966. Um, gotta wonder uh, how old she is now. But uh, anyways, um, this image, as you can see, I have the actual um, centerfold here, and it's it's almost identical. Uh, it should be noted that. Um, the radio teletype operators, they were able to sort of trace. They, would, they could put tracing paper on top, of, um, on top of the actual centerfold and run it through the machine, type over it, and then clean up the tape, run it through like six or seven passes, and get it to look almost exactly like the original. And so they were kind of acting as um, human, human scanners, basically. Okay. In the 70s, uh, we started to see a really uh, rapid shift to the video display terminal. And this kind of um, introduced some new options as far as um, text-based art goes, um, as well as some limitations. Uh, but one of the things that you could do with a terminal that you couldn't do uh, with, say, like a typewriter or something is you could have animation. We'll see if it works. <laughs> so this is a very early uh, VT100 ASCII animation. Um, in the 1980s, on the IBM PC, People started to develop software to make it easier to create these um, animations. And uh, with the advent of the ANSI standard, you could also introduce colors, um, do other sort of modifications. Um, in 1986, Ian Davis released a program called The Draw. And um, this was very pow powerful. Pow um, previous to that, there was a program called ANSI Draw. It's very limiting and challenging to use. Um, so this, was, this really sparked a new generation of artists, of ANSI artists. Just like with the, with the radio teletype, um, people found ways to exchange this ANSI art. Uh, they would use message networks on bulletin boards, such as WWIV net, FIDO net, uh, networks such as that. And these are just a couple examples. Um, I've mentioned ASCII and ANSI. These are all different coding standards. Um, not everybody used the ASCII standard, or they used modifications or supersets of the ASCII standard. Uh, the Atari 400-800 used their own standard here that you can see. Um, and they were able to achieve their own kind of uh, Atari animations here. This is, they called them break animations. Um, I spoke with Tom D'Ambrosio and he said that the break animation term came about because people would say, hey, I'm gonna take a break, take a look at this, take a look at this animation I created. The Hacula bat. And this is uh, probably a little bit faster than it would actually display on a standard modem connection. So it just depends.
see if he makes it in. He has. Okay. <laughs> also, the Commodore PET um, and the C64, they have their own proprietary uh, standard. Um, it was not compatible with ASCII. So if you were to call into a Commodore PET BBS, um, it wouldn't display properly. You would, you would basically see gibberish and vice versa. Um, unless they were emulating that character, the correct character set. But by default, if you were to call out, um, you wouldn't see the correct characters. They had a shifted set that you can see here. Um, so you could actually choose two different character sets built into the system. I don't know, I didn't have a Commodore 64, but I know that eventually, um, like the Mac even emulated ANSI eventually, so um, I'm sure that they did. This is a, an example of a pet ski. That's what they called their uh, Commodore 64 art. This is the Amiga character set. Um, it's slightly different than the IBM PC character set, but it's using the ASCII, um, first 128 characters here are based on ASCII, so these could all communicate the same way. They're talking the same language. So really the only difference here is the characters look a little different as far as the way the C and the D are are rendered, but the extended characters down below um, are ve very different. So in an ANSI, uh, if it was using these block characters here or these shaded characters here, um, they wouldn't appear to be correct from the Amiga by default. Uh, today we're using Unicode. You can see it has a lot more um, options as far as characters go to select from. Uh, people are utilizing Unicode. There's a huge scene in Japan on uh, Ni Chanaru, two channel BBS, that does really amazing work uh, with the katakana and um, hiragana scripts. Uh, it's really amazing stuff. Uh, text demos can, um, the demos that are created on the computers, they can actually modify the character sets as well. So you have, you know, kind of an unlimited number of options. That got ahead of me there. Okay. Well, that displayed been on here, but um, basically, this is an example of of ANSI art. Uh, this was created in 1980, or actually 1990, uh, by myself and a friend named Grimm. Uh, this is a louder than bombs ANSI uh, for a BBS in, in um, Southern California. Um, Aces of ANSI Art is the first documented team of text mode artists to exist as, as far as it goes. Um, a year later, several of those members, including myself, uh, split off to form ACID, or ANSI Creators in Demand. And soon after, very soon after, came ICE and many other groups. Uh, Amiga ASCII artists um, also formed into groups in 92, um, groups such as Art and Upper Class and hundreds followed. Um, this, is a, this is a really great ANSI. This is one of the first long scrollers. This is uh, many, many lines long. Uh, this right here is the 80 by 25 window that you would see. So you'd see this much, and then it would scroll down very slowly at 2400 baud. This is another ANSI animation for the bog by Tracer and Jed. Well, <laughs> let's try that again. I agree. Hmm. Let's try 9600. It's not outputting. 
Lovely. All right, my computer's not liking me. Okay. Yeah, it's super pissed. No, might have to restart. This is not inspiring me right now. <coughs> yeah, I have actually a couple videos and it's not displaying them. Okay. Yeah, PowerPoint and video, mm, always problems. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I'm going to restart. You can reboot faster than this. But anyways, um, I guess while this is rebooting, are there any questions? Um, I was about 14 when I first started ACID. <laughs> and actually, that's the typical age, right, for most people when they start BBSing, I thought. Um, or at least the people that I was interacting with, that was a pretty common age for when they started to get involved with BBSing. Um, one of the inspirations for me uh, was an artist called Ebony Eyes, who is documented in Jason Scott's BBS documentary. She was one of the early, uh, really great, talented ANSI artists. Um, also, the people in Aces of ANSI Art. Um, these things like New York City subway art and stuff come to mind? And um, maybe not directly, but uh, you know, I definitely am a fan of that style of artwork. and. You start to see a lot of that urban style of artwork reflected in ANSI, especially as it, as the styles develop over time, they become more and more complex. Um, so there is a lot of kind of graffiti style ANSI art out there. Also, the process of drawing a long scroller, where you can only—it's kind of like a subway. Yeah. Kind of like painting a subway car on its side because you can only see a certain section of it while you're drawing it. You have to step back. Especially the yeah, there's, there's a um, there's a limitation of 16 colors, so there's there's really kind of really primary colors that you have to work with uh, within ANSI art. You ever make your own font? Uh, what do you mean by font? Which type of font? Um, I've modified the DOS character sets, yeah, um, for like uh, custom uh, DOS utilities and such. Um, view, one of the earlier versions of Acid View modified uh, the character set as well. All right, so we're just going to unfortunately have to skip through that video. <laughs> um, yeah, a lot of modems supported hardware compression like MNP. So um, if the two modems both had the same type of compression supported, it would actually display it slightly faster you'd get some speed or some time savings there. All right, let's see if it'll, just let me move past it. Okay, I'm gonna skip that and go on to this. This is just a still screenshot. Um, from an ANSI animation that was very long by Amroth. It was actually a coded PC animation, uh, which was kind of a, a term that was coined for ANSI animations. Um, I highly recommend downloading this. Um, you can go to like uh, artscene.textfiles.com or pick up the Dark Domain DVD and check this out. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, this right here is called a collection of Amiga ASCII art. This is how 
Amiga ASCII artists started to distribute their work. They called it a Kali. So this is just a short excerpt of the top of that collection. And so basically they would have a logo or picture or face of some sort created with the Amiga character set and then have a break line, the credits, the name of it, and carry on like that. And these would go on for hundreds of lines. Um, eventually we started to see these really complex text mode demos. This is an earlier screenshot of one. This is a literal screenshot. You can see how the thing kind of bows right here. Um, <laughs> so this is a true screenshot. Um, this one I want to show later because I don't trust PowerPoint. Uh, this is the Starport um, text mode BBS tro. So they're advertising their BBS. This file originally was very small, was maybe a couple kilobytes at most. And this does modify the character set at the very bottom. It modifies the character set for a scrolling effect that changes in when it goes from uh, right to left. And this also modifies the character set. This probably is um, one of the most complex text mode demos, in my opinion, as far as, as, far as um, taking advantage of the IBM PC text mode. It actually does vectors. Uh, 3D vectors in text mode. Um, the text mode demo concept is confined to the PC realm, but you also do see them. This is an Amiga ASCII demo, so they do exist on the Amiga. Uh, this is in a world of ASCII. It's a screenshot from that. has a little rotating three-dimensional cube, and then the Amiga-style ASCII art face in the foreground while that rotates in the background. Um, there's not really any animation per se on the Commodore 64, but there are kind of um, art packs with music in the background. So they'll show different uh, Petsky C, um, CG art and then have the music play. There's a lot of different art communities. As I mentioned before, there's uh, Channel 2 or Ni Channel Ru, uh, which is the Japanese ASCII scene. Um, there's the standard US ASCII pure Hardcore ASCII, where they only use the 7-bit ASCII, none of the extended characters on uh, alt ASCII art news groups. There's Amiga and PC scenes that kind of identify their own unique character sets. And so this is, uh, let me go right back here. I mentioned that the Amiga and the PC ASCII scenes kind of have their own style. So this is, uh, this is a PC style. And so for shading, these a lot of the dollar signs, percentage signs here, um, the IBM PC line, the logo, it says Hacienda right there in the lower right corner. Um, and then this is the Amiga style. And this is, I, 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 this is one of my favorite pieces. This is a very much a graffiti piece. It says the yard. I don't know if any of you can make that out. It'll take a while to look at it. Once it comes to you, you're like, this is pretty amazing. Um, but, you know, that's a T-H-E yard. Um, and they kind of tend to kind of start with one character and then modify it and make each one look kind of similar but different. Um, it's a really popular style. So this is a colorized Amiga ASCII. Let's see if this works. It's not as bad. <laughs> this is a scrolling... ANSI, and so the colors are way off. The palette's really screwed up. But that's kind of how a, um, a BBS would display um, an ANSI in an A25 window. Uh, before I go on and show some of the ASCII demos, just want to take another break, see if there's any questions. Nothing? What's up? OK, what's up? Um, I would imagine it just really depends. The ANSI animations that you saw earlier, um, well, I'll have to show you another one, but Water Than Bombs one was pretty simplistic. The one that was crashing was for the bog, and that was literally drawn frame by frame in ANSI, and it takes a long time just to draw an ANSI, a single frame. And so these were, um, each frame is, is drawn, or each portion of the frame that's modified is drawn by hand. Uh, whereas with the demos that I'm about to show you, they're, you know, they're constructed in a similar fashion as a regular demo and then rendered out to ASCII. 
using ASCII character sets. What do you think about the programs that they use where they have a picture and they'll convert it to ASCII where they almost have an right. ASCII character for ASCII. each pixel? Sure, it, that seems like it, they're cheating. Yeah, that's pretty much the common consensus is that they're cheating. Um, there's like an ASCII Babes website that you can go to and you can see uh, Sarah Michelle Geller or whoever from X-Files, whatever her name is, and they have it converted into ASCII. Um, yeah, it's not done, there's no human element involved to that. It's just a program routine converts it to, an, to a text file. Um, the ASCII scene does consider that to be cheating. Um, so I, yeah, I guess the answer is yes. Um, people do that. Some people have tried to do that within the ASCII scenes and then clean it up a little bit because usually what it produces are, you know, if you're trying to do it in an actual 80 width, you know, 80 columns wide format, it produces undesirable results. So you'd have to actually go through and clean that up a lot unless you're blowing it out to something and then shrinking down the font size in HTML, which you might as well just have the, you know, JPEG at that point. Right, there's, there was actually, um, uh, there was an artist named Terminator 2 in the ANSI scene who would try and uh, accomplish ANSI art as small as possible, make it identifiable as small as possible, um, rather than these huge blown out long scrollers. So there was also uh, a couple different fields of thought there as well. So I'm kind of blinded by the light, so I can't see if you're raising your hand. <laughs> Is that it? Okay. All right, so this is the Starport text mode demo that I wanted to show. And maybe it'll show. So this is playing, I believe, um, FM music, tablet style music, and then it's it's doing this right here where it actually has a modified character set to show you this scroller that modifies from uh, right to left the perspective. And this is texture, we'll see if this plays. Maybe not. All right. Uh, yeah, the the artists, it looks like they didn't have any ANSI artists there. Mm, okay, we'll go with this one. exclusively the block characters here. Um, just blocks, half blocks, kind of simulating um, anti-aliasing as well. 
Uh, they're using the, the white and the gray and uh, darker. This is an executable, yeah. Yeah, this is not coded, you know, frame by frame or anything. This is not drawn out frame by frame or anything like that. And drawn. This is Bolognese by Alpha Design. particular person who coded this bright light, he seems to um, lives in Finland and he attends the assembly, which is one of the largest uh, demo parties in the world, and he tends to sweep half of the competitions every year. You <laughs> see him get on stage about four times for awards. This is Mr. T, <laughs> everybody knows. Um, the artist who did this Mr. T he wanted to make this a stroller and then say, I pity the fool who doesn't vote for this text mode demo. He didn't have time. All right, I'm gonna see if I can drop this down. I don't know. Yeah, we'll see. Let's go with this one. There's an annual event called TMDC, which is the text mode demo competition. So um, it's an online competition. You don't have to actually show up anywhere to enter. And you can um, submit uh, your, you know, review their guidelines and submit something if you're interested in this form of art. So you can see that they, um, instead of using the solid block style here, they're using a lot of shading. Um, it doesn't look quite as smooth, but they're able to simulate more colors than the 16 colors that are limited uh, within ANSI or the PC text mode. Nine minutes, 43 minutes. I have no idea. Locking and lock. Yeah, it doesn't always translate. Like Four I said, through a conversion. Whoa. A little scroller. I'm a, 
I'm assuming that's Bruce Lee. Yeah, those are just computer conversions. No cleaning up. maybe two more this was the winner at uh, the 2004 Texmo demo competition oh, amazing. Uh, this is created by the Trailer Park demo group. So you can see that the coders here uh, took a little bit more care in their choices for coder palette here. They're a lot more um, pleasing to the eye to look at than some of the others. Uh, yeah, in fact, this next one is using more ASCII characters than shaded characters. This is Signal to Droids. Northern Dragons are out there. Um, this, uh, well, I know there's a few, but that's the only text mode one that I'm aware of. So this is Signal to, Signal to Droids by Northern Dragons.
Probably, yeah. Okay, let's see. I just want to humor myself and see if I can get this to work here now. No, probably not, but... Bog. Yeah, let's try it. This is what it should have looked like in PowerPoint. This is the bog ANSI. This was released in the early 90s for a BBS bog. And like I said, each of these were drawn one frame at a time. That's for pissing in the bog. So that's an, that's an example of, a, of an ANSI animation. It's one of my favorites. It's kind of funny. Um, that concludes most of the show. Um, again, all of them can be um, downloaded online. You can go to a site such as artscene.textfiles.com if you'd like to find more about these. I also have a DVD for $10 um, that has all of these um, ANSI animations, ANSIs and ASCIs, dating back you know, all the way from the 80s up until um, 2004, all collected on a single DVD. Um, a lot of these were um, entered in competitions. For those who aren't aware, there's a block party competition that's happening tonight at midnight where a lot of uh, coders, artists, and musicians are going to be presenting this stuff. So I encourage you all to show up um, at midnight if you, if you like this kind of stuff and you want to see more of these animations and music and creative things produced from the demo scene. Um, and that's about it. Is there any other questions? Yeah? For 80, 80 by 50 and 80 by 25 have different... 80 by 50 and 80 by 25 always had different aspect ratios. Right. Did you have a preference? Um, does the scene have a preference? 80 by 50 always seemed better. It was uh, 80 by 50, one one. right? You can do more detail. I've always preferred 80 by 25 because that's what I grew up with and started with. Um, it seemed like there was a small segment of the European scene. Um, I have a couple of friends that are Finnish that are really into 80 by 25 ANSI's. They're more compressed um, looking, but I prefer the 80 by 25 style. Oh, here's the Dark Domain DVDs. On the PC and 80 by 25, meet up together. Right. Um, <laughs> on an IBM PC in 80 by 25, if you're trying to do the ASCII line art style, we're using slashes, backslashes, and pipes and such. Um, the slashes won't meet up with each other, whereas they would in 80 by 50 on, on a DOS machine. In the Amiga, they do connect because the character set's just slightly different by a few pixels. And so that's why. Um, an Amiga ASCII artist always prefers that their ASCII is viewed on an Amiga platform or Amiga emulator. Okay, well thank you very much for showing up.